Recording in progress. Yes. It has to let us know that it's recording. That's the rule. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, state law differs in different places, I'm sure. But hey, everybody out there, all of you listeners, this is The Broken Brain. I'm Dwight, back with you again. Super, super excited today. I am joined by the stars and directors of Playdate, uh, Amberly Coulson and Laura Campbell. Um, Playdate's a short film that is world premiering at the Dallas Film Festival on the 28th. I think that's this Saturday from when we're recording. Exciting. Um, now, the description I have is it says it's a story that follows two mothers forging an unexpected connection on the one year anniversary of a school shooting, reliving the precious moments of their daughter's final play date. And um, I got to watch this. This is a fantastic uh, film that really captures this really complicated issue. So I'm super excited to uh, share that with all of you out there. So, first of all, Amberly and Laura, welcome. We're so glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. We're Thank so, you. so happy to be here. One of the things that I found uh, powerful, well, there's a lot of things I found powerful about the film. Um, you guys are the stars and and uh, directed the, the film as well, as I said. And one of the things that I thought was very powerful was that uh, was your names, actually, the names of the characters. And um, we'll we'll get into that a little. First of all, I should give you a chance, though. Uh, you tell people about the film. You should give your own intro. I read the press release. <laughs> we loved your intro. Yeah, I thought that was great. <laughs> well, you're great. You're, you're you guys who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great description. Um, yeah, I mean, what you said was was it? It's two women reuniting, you know, on the year anniversary of a very tragic event, um, and they have a surprising connection when they start to reenact their daughter's last day together. Um, and yeah, it's going to be on Saturday at 8 p.m. and Sunday at 1.15 um, at the Violet Crime Theater. In Dallas. Yes, Auditorium yes. 2. It's really great. I've been able to be a bit of a part because I've been, uh, but I'm virtual. I couldn't get to Dallas uh, to actually ah. be on the ground, but talking to people and getting some of these wonderful screeners, um, and so let me ask you about this, just hitting it off, the names mm. of your characters, I thought was very mm. interesting. And and I, I'm, I don't know if you have any insights as to how those were chosen. Amberly, you play, mm. your, your character name is Host, right? And Lori, yours is okay. Guest, as you're coming over to, to the host's house. Any, anything you can share about those choices? Sure, yeah. I mean, this, you know, this script came to me about four years ago. So it's been workshopped a lot. And when we, you know, as you know, I, you know, as I've been told and many times and have experienced through this process, a movie is kind of written three times. You have the script and then you have what happens on the day be based on locations, changing of crew, anything like that, schedule. And then you have the edit. Um, so it's sort of not written until it's edited uh, fully. And for us, when we started you know, seeing what we had and and um, working through what these women meant. In our minds, they have names in our in our actors, you know, how we know who they are, we know what their names are, we know where they're from, all of that. But for this piece, because their names are never mentioned, we wanted to really highlight the names of the children, first and foremost. The children's names, Beth and Jenny, are the only names that are mentioned in the piece itself. And then to really highlight the idea of the play date, right? So there's a there's a party, there's a guest, and there's a host. Um, and to also reference the fact that like this is this could be anybody. You know, you could put your name on these people and have this experience. It's not it's 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 not far away from from all of us. That's what I loved about it was that yeah, it makes it more accessible to people, and mm -hmm. I think anyone out there, I'd be very surprised. I don't like to paint with a broad brush, but I'd be surprised if anyone hasn't uh, felt some of this nervousness about sending our children to school, uh, especially, you know, obviously the day or week or month after. But um, when you're living in a, in a time and a nation where we're getting reports of these shootings basically all the time, some of them don't even make it to the front page anymore. And I right. thought you guys captured that in a way of here's two people who not only have that fear, but have lost their children. Right. Yeah. I, one of the things that I thought was interesting now, Amberly, you play the host to um, Laura's character is coming over to your house. 
where the the final play date took place, right? It was a play date and sleepover. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things I thought was very interesting was how you showcased the guilt that the mm-hmm. host feels at being the one to take them to school, right? Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about about how you portrayed that. Um, yeah, I mean, the the all we could do, you know, Laura and I, when we were prepping is just saturate ourselves with watching countless documentaries and interviews and, you know, just trying to get inside this world, um, this unimaginable terror. And um, so the survivor's guilt right out of the gate when I read Gavin's script was so apparent and so visceral. I mean, it just, I, I feel fortunate that I, you know, obviously I've not lived Chris, the host's life. Excuse me, I just gave away my secret <laughs> name, my actor. Real name. Um, Breaking but, news yeah. here on the podcast. Oh my God, spoiler alert. Um, so, so to answer your questions, I, you know, I, I was talking, Lauren and I were actually talking about this, like the guilt feels so heavy and, and burdensome and, and the, the way you fault find, like the way when things, what I found when I was working on this is, um, it almost felt the guilt was so heavy that I, I was responsible for deciding that her daughter go to school that day. And, I, and it felt like if I'm, what was coming up was just this, let me pain myself. So you like, well, how do I make it you not be in pain? And I think that's so human to do these weird mental gymnastics to make sense of things that don't make sense. So I don't know to answer your question as far as like how I did it. I just felt like we just, you know, we just kept taking on these imaginary circumstances and the, you know, guilt feels so human. And, you know, I know how to connect to that, you know, so um, I'm not answering your question, but it just, it feels. Oh, I think um, you are. Yeah. <laughs> universal. You know what I mean? Like I just, the guilt unfortunately is so real, but this kind of guilt is just so um, heavy and. Uh- Absolutely. You do it. Yeah. No, I, that's that's a great answer because of carrying that in. I felt having worked with so many people with so many different kinds of trauma over the years, I really saw that portrayed in both of you from the different perspectives. I should add, I think I made it sound like both of the children had had perished. Your character's daughter is still alive in the in the story. She not doesn't appear. In f- Correct. In fact, Correct. there's a birthday party like set up well, as yes. as Amber Lee is. Uh, I should say no, Laura. As your character comes in, right? You you see the all of that, and that's got a that that added a whole level of complexity. Uh, I felt as well. Good. Yeah. Good. I felt like one of the strengths of the show too is that uh, your character uh, Laura never says "I forgive you." Now you never mm-hmm. she never says those words. She just yeah. says, "I don't want to talk about it." Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wonder if you guys have feelings about that. What well, the reason I feel like it's a strength because that's sort of a that would be an easy thing to fall into, and maybe a longer film would have to address that. Uh, you know, but uh, just saying, like, you know, that's it's not that that's not that simple. Yeah, it's not that simple, right? And it felt very real to us. And that a, I think a historical nature of these two women, they were friends before this, their daughters were friends before this, right? This, this event has created a wedge of complications that you can imagine. Um, And I think for this idea of forgiveness, we talked a lot about this. There is no resolution to these things, right? There is no forgiving. There is no, like this tragedy is the, the most unimaginable thing I can I can fathom. Um, And I think for these two friends to see each other in these moments and to hold each other, to, to, to hear what her guilt is and just be there with it instead of trying to get rid of it, trying to fix it, trying to make it okay for her, I think is probably one of the most powerful and friendly things you can do for somebody because it's not about making me feel better by forgiving you. It's about you feel that. Mm-hmm. And I, I yeah, it, it's completely natural for her to feel that. And I'm sure that I'm sure, I mean, in, in the work that I did as the character, there is blame. Blame flies around, you know, it goes from this person to this person to this person to definitely myself. 
you know, so it's definitely pinged off of her at some point. So I get why you think that, cause I've had it, I've had that thought too, you know? And I think, I, I think I am really glad that you caught on to that, that we didn't really let them, you know, the audience off that easy to feel like, oh, there's a resolve. Oh, oh, there's a forgiveness there. Then we can feel better about ourselves and move on. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, I think the point is they don't move on. So, and I, I want people to remember that. Yeah, you know. it's more of a story of coping and surviving. It's not the, the. Yeah. I really like how you said that. It doesn't let us off the hook as the viewer to say, oh, look how they've oh. thrived beyond. And you're very much, in fact, the guest character, we really don't, uh, uh, we don't have a sense of her internal life very much other than what we can project and assume and feel based on how she's acting. I feel like the host more verbally trying to process. And, and mm -hmm. in fact, to the point where uh, even though your character doesn't display animosity exactly, just kind of like, no, 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 no we're not going to, uh, uh nope, nope, nope. <laughs> a couple of times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it also typifies one of the things that I think is very important when you are uh, connected to someone who has a tragedy, which is, I don't know what to say. And and the mistake, the most common mistake people make is they don't say anything at all or they right. drop off some muffins and that's all or something, right? Yeah, yeah no, totally. And, and, and just saying anything. And in this case, this was a very interesting example of someone kind of doing, not just saying, right? It's saying, yeah, come over uh, to my house. The implication is the guest asked, I think, to come over is what it, at least that's <laughs> what it seemed like. It didn't seem like you'd. Oh, right. Your okay. Yeah. Said it. But I don't know if that's the case. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but the different, uh, but, but I wanted to get some of your, your uh, impressions about that dynamic of people not knowing what to say. So they either say nothing or they awkwardly try to say something. Totally. Yeah. No, I think we, we talked a lot about that. I mean, my character gets to be a little bit more of the audience perspective as far as um, tiptoeing around a subject she doesn't know how to handle. And with their friendship being estranged and her survivor's guilt, she, what I experienced is I don't know how to go about it. I have to lean in and follow your lead, which we thought was really beautiful about these women coming back together and sort of echoing what Laura said earlier and what you pointed out is what was really clear to both of us very early on in the development was the power of feeling seen. And um, what I found to be true, you know, is that by leaning in and kind of what Gavin did when he wrote the script of this is, I'm going to confront everything that feels so, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't know where my guilt even belongs in your grief. Like, it feels so sticky and human and you're trying to sort so much um, that when these women give Beth a presence driven by Laura's character and go into this imaginary play date that they, that what I think, and this is my point of view is just that the guest is able to grieve and the host is able to be there for her in a way that they haven't been for a year. And that, that's the power, you know, that's what the gift they give each other without knowing it, you know, they stumble through it, through this very awkward dance. And it captures it very well. Once again, just from my own experiences of seeing uh, lots of these different situations that, that it does capture and you guys portray it very powerfully. I, Thank you. I was Thank curious you. about your thoughts about the guests uh, sort of coping practices um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I love the way that that's depicted. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what the guest is doing to go through this experience? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple things going on. Um, one is that, you know, the first time you see the guest, all you're seeing is a, a very wide smile through a peephole essentially. Right. And that smile is pretty, it stays pretty constant, um, through most of the, the, the film and that choice was made that was in the script so uh the choice was made because you know when you're going when you've gone through something like this and I think you know we've heard this a lot from people that have gone through this from mothers that have gone through this that 
the days following, the weeks following, the months following, the years following in their communities, when they walk around, when they go to the grocery store, when they walk down the street, they encounter people and they don't always want to uh, be there for them, right? So they cross the road, they turn down a different aisle in the grocery store to avoid them because they make them uncomfortable because somehow they're re- radioactive or they feel contagious. It's to, they don't know what to do or handle it. So we made the choice of this character to make people feel more comfortable with her just did what she thought would be the natural thing to do, which is smile all the time, which then actually comes across as quite unnatural because it's a forced smile. Right? It, it so, is immediately puts you at a little bit of a, oh, oh, oh wow. It, it looks, there's a lot of pain contained in that smile. Yeah. yeah. Right. That must have and been a little bit of work to convey that <laughs> non-verbally because that's a lot to say with your face. <laughs> so, Yeah. It's a lot to say with your face. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I, I, yeah, I, I, it was a tough one. It was a, there was a lot of work put into that <laughs> smile for sure, because it is, you know, you do have to find a reason for it. There's, there's gotta be a reason. It can't just be like, oh, this person's walking around with a smile and you're not quite sure why there's a, there's a, there's a motivation for the smile and the motivation for the smile is there existing at the same time as what is going on on the inside, which is this just devastation. Um, so there's that, you know, that coping mechanism, which I thought was very profound by Gavin to really have insight into and to to have a visual aspect of something that goes on on the outside world that we don't, you know, we don't see in the film. And then the other coping mechanism, of course, is the Tetris game that she comes in with. And um, that's based on a very real study, an Oxford study um, about PTSD that, they find that if you play 20 minutes of a Tetris game or something like that, that has hand-eye coordination and moving things and um, a goal, uh, immediately after a traumatic event, it diverts the neural neural pathways so that the, the images don't ingrain so deeply in your brain. So PTSD is, is a degree lesser than it would be if you were not playing that game right after a traumatic event. And this character, you know, offers one to the host and says she has them everywhere. And and I think we do that in our lives. We we think of worst case scenarios and then we try to prevent them by doing things like stepping over cracks, like not walking under ladders. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that we do in life to try and prevent these things from happening. And this woman has experienced the worst of the worst. Mm-hmm. And now she's like, well, if I had this, it would have been better for me. So maybe everybody should have this. She says paramedics should carry these because this happens so often. Her point is it could be you. So you should have this Tetris game in just in case. She says, just in case. Yeah. yeah this that's, happens. that's a, that was very powerful. And it is great to see some of those techniques that actually in real life, they're doing more and more yeah. studies of things like that. We've done a couple episodes on the usefulness ah. mentally and psychologically, even of <laughs> video games and how there's lots of studies about that where we used to just think, meh. Um, right, right, right. I was fascinated as well by the sort of uh, regressive childlike behaviors that she mm-hmm. literally was going through. Where did she sit? What did she eat? Would you make me a sandwich? You know, uh, as well, that there were these these childlike behaviors that she was going through mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that man, that was one of the most powerful things because I think she was you know, as I was going through it, you think to yourself, well, she touched this carpet and she sat in this chair and just the physical like molecules, my molecules being in the presence of her molecules in in a place that I didn't even know she sat and I didn't even know she went and I didn't even know she ate and felt that, you know, it was such a powerful, powerful experience. Uh, yeah, I that that one really got me. It got me. Yeah, I think any any I would challenge any parent to watch that without busting, yeah. you know, breaking down. Um, Amber Lee, your character at one point reaches over and and touches Laura's face, and mm-hmm. I found that to be once again there was this comforting pureness about that, and it reminded me a little bit of what of the way a parent might comfort a child. As yeah. well as how a friend very, you know, might might have that intimate connection with a friend. 
Yeah. Oh my God, Dwight, you picked up on all the fun things. Like, it's very I wish I was on your shoulder when you were watching. Oh, no, it is quite yeah. emotional to hear someone have. Yeah, you know, to get, it's to really, it means a things. lot. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, it's a very powerful, so powerful uh, show. I would encourage anybody. Is there any, this is often not something that you know yet pre-debut mm-hmm. at a film festival, but is there a way that people are going to be able to see this if they're not able to be at the film festival? Yeah, I really hope so. Yeah. I mean, we are we are looking at many different avenues for that, right? So uh, we will, this is the beginning of our festival run. It usually lasts about a year. So we'll go around the country um, showing this film in different festivals. So you can follow us on Instagram, Playdate Film, and our website, um, Playdate Film. And uh, and yeah, and, and keep up to date on those. And then, yeah, we hope to work with maybe different organizations, get this out there in a way that would help support um already existing um organizations that are that are work doing the good work on this issue um and then we're working on a, a limited series based on this um short so hopefully it will have a life beyond this yes. as well is that the best yeah. place for people to follow not just the project but you guys and your work yes uh, well we're on there we're on playdate yeah we both have instagrams laura campbell i think i don't know laura ea campbell and Amberly underscore Coulson. There we go. Right. <laughs> and yeah, and Playdate, I think, is just, yeah, Playdate film on Instagram. Yes. And we can share the link with you. Yeah, we'll share the links. Oh, yeah. very much oh. so. Yes, yes. I'll get that from you guys to share that. Thank you uh, so much for being on. I wanted to ask you one other uh, question before we go, which uh, are there any of these organizations that you're going to be partnering with that you would name uh, specifically? I often ask people for sure. a charity or nonprofit that they like that's near and dear to them. Sure. It, and, and it doesn't actually have to be connected to our conversation, but if there is one that you'd like to throw out, uh, then, then sure. please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we are not we're not officially connected with any of the organizations, but we like to highlight them. And Moms Demand Action is something that's very in line with this, obviously. And uh, March for Our Lives is another one that we really um, are, you know, think they're doing great work. So I would absolutely encourage anybody to go check them out, donate, help Wonderful. out wherever you can. Wonderful. Well, best of luck uh, with the festival. Best of luck. You're already in it, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> no, it's still the year. It's still the Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And thank you so much, so much for being on the, the Broken Break today. Oh, it's thank such you. a pleasure. Thank right. you so, thank you so, so much. much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.